This presentation includes forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties. Actual results may differ materially as a result of various risk factors, including those described in the 10Ks, 10Qs, and 8Ks VMware files with the SEC. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome VMware's Chief Executive Officer, Mr. Pat Gelsinger. Thank you very much. Welcome to those of you who are here with us in the room and to those many who are following us online through a streaming uh, broadcast. We're excited that you'd uh, choose to join us today for an exciting announcement. And really, it's really two announcements in one. It's a strategic announcement of our direction in uh, cloud native applications and also a couple of specific open source technologies that we're announcing today that we think are foundational components for this evolving uh, space. This is a picture that we believe that faces every IT manager today, where fundamentally they have the vast majority of their assets and spending in the client server world, and they need to plant their strategy for the emerging mobile cloud world. And across that, they have nominally flat budgets. So how do they deal with that challenge? They have to find ways to reduce their spend in their old and increase their spend in the new, but almost everything that they do in the new is a composite of the old and the new. They need to be accessing different services, different databases, et cetera, and thus it's not just that they need to migrate, right, they need a bridge across those two worlds because they need to effectively connect those together. In between that challenge, you know, we talk to hundreds of CIOs in an ongoing dialogue, and VMware is uniquely positioned to help them build that bridge across those two environments. No company has helped them transform their existing environments anywhere near as effectively as VMware has over the last decade and a half. And our technologies are also foundational for that mobile cloud future. And today's announcement is a next set of technologies that help them bridge those two worlds. We've laid out a strategy for this new architecture of IT. And we call it very simply one cloud, any application, any device. And one cloud, what do we mean by that? We see that customers today, they'll have their on-premise cloud, their private cloud. They might have managed clouds that they're receiving some from somebody else to manage on their behalf for their applications or public cloud resources. But across those environments, they want to view that as a continuous spectrum of resources that they have increasing flexibility and dynamic choice across those three embodiments. The way we accomplish that one cloud architecture is a common set of technologies, right? A unified platform called the Software Defined Data Center that enables that to occur. Compute, network, storage, all of which virtualized through a layer of management or increasingly automation. And any cloud environment must ruthlessly automate everything to accomplish the scale, agility, and efficiency of a cloud environment. Once we've created that abstraction, we enable a transformation of the underlying infrastructure from a build your own environment to a converged infrastructure and a, a hyper-converged infrastructure. But of course, we build infrastructure for one purpose and one purpose alone, run applications, right? And against that, it's one application category combined of the old and the new, right? We need any app to be able to run on that infrastructure. And again, right, you know, the, the bad news for enterprises is applications are sticky and long, right? And they need to be able to transition even as they're embracing these new mobile cloud worlds, combining those with those existing environments. And again, a one cloud architecture enables the embodiment of any application, both the old and the new. And finally, it must be delivered onto any device, securely managing onto today's devices as well as the emerging mobile devices of tomorrow. Today's discussion is specifically, right, about this any application uh, area. Inside of that, you know, we're thrilled that this architecture allows us to enable enterprises to securely build, run, and manage any application. The environment where they can take their traditional apps, combine it with these emerging new mobile cloud applications, and bring those together into a common 
architectural framework that allows us to emerge. Today's announcement is very much about the cloud native application strategy for VMware, how we're supporting a increasing set of innovations that occur for apps that are truly developed in a cloud native way, but enabling that through a broad partnership, a broad ecosystem, and you'll be hearing from several of those in the course of our discussion uh, this morning. As we lay that out, we see that increasingly this open, vibrant, dynamic ecosystem plays an increasingly critical role as part of our strategy. As such, we've chosen to bring several key technologies forward into the open source community, key technologies that we think enable an acceleration of this community, but doing so built on the rock hard capabilities of VMware really gives a unified platform architecture. We have three open source technologies that we're announcing today. One of those is by our partner Pivotal, right? the Lattice uh, framework, which they'll be discussing further today. Two of those by VMware. One is Photon, a lightweight Linux operating system distribution focused on containers and optimized for the VMware environment. And the second is an identity and access management environment specifically focused on securing and managing the delivery of container applications in the future. These two, Photon and LightWave plus Lattice, give three new critical building blocks for this cloud native application world. And you know, we're simply thrilled that you all would join us today. We think this is exciting. This is not the end. This is the beginning of a journey to enable these cloud native applications on top of the VMware technologies and into an accelerating enterprise marketplace who wants to embrace and take advantage of these new approaches for application development. With that, it's my pleasure to turn the bulk of today's announcement over to Kit Colbert. Kit is a 12-year veteran of VMware, and in many respects, he's done it all. Right? He's been in the bowels of ESX. Right? He's been in the right, edges of what we do for end-user computing. And over the last year or so, he's gotten extremely passionate about positioning VMware on the front end of these cloud native development activities and he's been spearheading the activities in this area and thus there's no one better than our principal engineer, uh, certified smart guy and passionate cloud native leader Kit Colbert to uh, discuss today's announcement with you. Thank you and Kit. Thank you Pat. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, uh, that was uh, very generous, Pat. You've now set the bar way too high for me. <laughs> uh, well, thank you guys so much. I'm really excited to be here today. As Pat stated, a lot of exciting announcements that we have, and uh, I'll, I'll dive into them, but before I do, I wanna play on a little bit of what Pat was saying about this changing landscape and this notion that everything's becoming software-defined, right? Businesses in all industries are having to take software and leverage that to better engage with their customers. And so in this new world, there's two real new imperatives that fall out of that. The first is that it's all about end user experience. And that doesn't just mean having a great web app, having a great mobile app. It's also about how you can use big data, Internet of Things, in order to crunch and analyze all that stuff so you can actually provide better insights to your customers. Those are the things that are really sticky and really differentiate businesses. But it's not just about the great software. It's also about reacting quickly to the market. It's about moving faster. These are big, big challenges because for any business, they may have a competitor that might move faster and beat them to market. So every business has to think about how they can leverage these technologies like Agile, moving toward everything as a service, and building on open source technologies. Again, a lot of stuff's happening out in the open. A lot of great building blocks are there, and so it's incumbent upon these businesses to build on that to, to move faster. But it's not just about the software. It's also about how infrastructure is changing. This is something Pat talked a little bit about. You know, the focus for so many years within the industry was all about consolidation. How do we optimize the efficiency of our data center? Right? And there it was really saving money, saving CapEx, driving that bottom line. But in this new world, what we're looking at is not so much cost savings. It's more around customer engagement. Right? Get, giving them better insights, helping them to, to pay the business more, making more money, driving top line growth. And so there what you want is you really want an application that can scale out, be distributed across a wide fabric of compute and storage and network in order to better serve customers. So these changes are very interesting in, in driving new forms of technologies. Speaking of which, you know, we use this term cloud native application. What exactly is a cloud native app? Well, in our definition, a cloud native app is an application that's been designed or built to run on a dynamic, elastic infrastructure. 
So this means that app knows stuff about the infrastructure. It knows it can call the infrastructure to ask it for things, things like provisioning additional copies of itself. This allows it to dynamically scale up, scale down, to meet the load of users. But you know, it's also a different assumption here, because the assumption of these apps is that given their massive scale, system failures at the hardware level, at the infrastructure level, will be common. And so the app has to deal with that. So you need to be able to detect and resolve those sorts of failures automatically within the app. So these are you know, some great opportunities here, but also some challenges. You can't just take one of your traditional apps and move it over here. You've got to think about a new architecture. And that new architecture is really moving from monolithic architecture to more of a distributed or scale-out architecture. Microservices is you know, all the rage right now, a lot of interest going in there, and how you take formerly a, a monolithic app and break it down to small pieces that all run independently. Those small pieces can then be delivered with things like Linux containers to really drive agility and reproducibility across environments. And as I said before, you know, these OpenStack pieces are so, or excuse me, OpenStack, open source pieces are so important uh, because it's really about not reinventing the wheel. It's about leveraging what these other technology giants have done and the kind of mistakes they've made and, and solutions they've found to move your business faster. So again, things from like, whether it's Google or Netflix, I mean, open sourcing a lot of the work they've done, now allowing businesses to go and drive that. So speaking of Netflix, Adrian Cockroft was the chief architect there and was responsible for a lot of the innovation they did around rethinking their whole architecture of microservices, this drive to move faster. So let's hear from Adrian about how he sees businesses leveraging these open source technologies to really be able to move faster and respond to the market more quickly. The microservices movement is uh, quite a hot movement right now. There's a lot of people talking about it. But what it's really about is breaking large applications into smaller chunks that can be uh, deployed individually and which let the company and you know, the product be more agile. So the advantage of doing microservice architectures is that you can get things done more quickly. Now, what that's really being driven by improvements in technology, whereas previously it took a long time to get releases into production, maybe weeks or months. And then when VM and cloud came along, you could do things in minutes. And now with containers, you can do things in seconds. So when you've got a pipeline to, to production that takes seconds, it doesn't make sense to try and redeploy you know, 5 million lines of Java in some huge uh, monolithic uh, tuple. Um, and what you really want to be doing is deploying little components of it and have everyone deploying all the time. So the ideal end state for businesses in this new world is that you have applications which are very agile, and they're built largely out of open source components because you can fix them, you can find them, and the whole procurement process is, is very short. Um, your, your developers are, are pushing to production themselves. Everything is API driven, everything is self-service. Uh, you build automation around things. Um, the, the, what used to be the operations team is now really becoming a platform team, and the platform team uses APIs to get things done. And you can really tell you've reached the, the end state when to get something into production, you, don't, you aren't filing tickets and having meetings, you're making API calls and it becomes self-service. Great, so a lot of good words of advice there from Adrian, right, about how you can take these technologies and put them into use across any business. And is that real ideal end state that you talked about, right? This is exactly what the Cloud Native Apps team at VMware wants to do, is to help customers get to that end state. But more specifically, our mission is very simple, and that is to make the developer a first-class user of the data center. You know, the reality is that this may seem like, whoa, this is a bit of a change of direction for VMware, right? You say, we haven't had as much developer focus in the past. I would actually argue that we have, and in fact, Pat's software-defined data center vision that he outlined just a few minutes ago is exactly in that direction. This idea of business agility, business velocity, I mean, think about what Adrian just said, right? This notion of developers wanting to make API calls, not file tickets. Developers wanting the responses to those API calls in seconds, not waiting for the action for hours, days, weeks. And so what we've been trying to drive within the software-defined data center is enabling businesses to build a self-service hybrid cloud exactly so that they can move faster. So we think we've actually been going this direction for many years and building that out together with our customers. However, for us in the Cloud Native Apps team, we need to do a bit more, right? And specifically, what is that? We need to extend on the software-defined data center vision. And that is, first, look at the full application lifecycle. Right? So we're very, very focused at running things in production and doing that the best. But what we need to do is look at that whole spectrum, all the way from the developer's laptop 
out to the production stack, you know, through the CI, CD uh, pipeline and that whole process, and really helping to optimize that. So we have a product in that space we just announced a few months ago called vRealize CodeStream. So the job of CodeStream is really to uh, provide automation and governance for the CI, CD pipeline so that you can fully move through there much quicker, get code from the developer's laptop out to the production in a safe and secure manner. So again, one step, lots more stuff to do, but definitely an area of focus for us. The next thing is to continue focus on the ops side and the production stack on how we can make sure these teams can run these cloud native applications in production. You know, the, the reality is that there's a lot of enterprise constraints on applications in terms of security and compliance and performance and many other things that need to work in order to run this in a production data center. And so it's really incumbent upon us to help our customers be able to achieve that for these next generation apps. And then the, the final one, as we talked about, is the growth of open source and really making sure that we're truly engaging in that community and not only leveraging the open standards and using open standards, but also contributing back to that community. So Pat talked about some of our announcements and I'll go into some more of those in a second uh, and how we do that. Now, as you can see, there's a lot of stuff to do here, right? A tremendous amount of stuff. Can't do it all at once, can't do it overnight. So you gotta focus, we gotta prioritize. And we talked to a lot of different customers and the thing that we heard very loud and clear from them when we asked them, what's the top of mind issue that you have? The, the thing that, they, that you know, was on top of their minds was security. How do I secure all these things as they go into production? How do I ensure that it's at compliance with my enterprise standards? So if you think about it, security actually is a big issue here. Right, we're moving from the monolithic architecture to a distributed microservices architecture. And when you do that, you move from you know, one, two, maybe five instances of an app that are running. Now you may have dozens or hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands. So think about the size of that application, that footprint that it has across the data center. Think about the complex topology that it has in terms of its network. I mean, just think about the attack surface on that and how do you actually secure that and validate that uh, every piece there is what it says it is and they can interact in the right ways. These are a lot of challenges. So we identified a few specific needs in this space. The first of which was a scalable identity infrastructure focused on cloud native applications and containers. The second was all around that networking piece. How do you enable dynamic network that can change with the application topology changes and provide the right set of security? And then the final piece is, of course, that runtime, the compute runtime, which you have to, you have to trust in order for anything to work, right? So these three pieces are what we're talking about today. So as we talk about them, let's look at a very simple high-level uh, architecture here for next-gen apps. So again, we have a host, a Linux host. Uh, again, and you know, Linux is kind of becoming a standard in this space, by the way. Uh, most of the web's, uh, web giants are using it and really build out an ecosystem around it. So we're seeing a lot of interest in that from customers. So on top of Linux, you have some sort of container engine you use to provision containers on that host. Now, of course, you don't have just one host, you have many hosts. And when you have many hosts, you need a network to connect them. You also need something on top which can orchestrate and schedule across all those hosts to make that set of hosts look like one giant pool of infrastructure. And then, of course, you have a repository where the code, the binaries, et cetera, live. But you know, there's one piece that's kind of missing, or at least one piece, <laughs> important for this discussion, one particular piece that's missing. And that's around identity. Because how do you ensure and validate the identity of all these different pieces? As I said, you know, some of those containers, you may have hundreds of thousands of those things running. So how do you glue that together and make sure there's, there's trust between all those different parts? So that's exactly what an identity and access management solution is looking like for this. And so let's get an example, right? Let's say that uh, there's a scheduling engine and needs to provision an application. So it, wants, it chooses a host and it wants to provision the app to that host. But how does it know that host is who it says it is, right? How does it know it can trust that host? It's got an IP address, but doesn't know much more about it than that. So these are the sort of questions we have to start thinking through in order to make sure that we actually can trust this infrastructure and these applications that we're building out. So that's exactly why we're happy to announce Project Lightwave, an open source identity management and access solution focused on cloud, app cloud native applications and containers. So what exactly is Lightwave? Again, Lightwave is focused on identity, authentication, authorization. Of course, it can do this for users, but as we said, you know, the focus isn't so much users. There's a bunch of existing solutions for that. The focus is really is on all the components and parts of that cloud native application and its infrastructure. Again, the different pieces of the app need to be able to talk to each other, need to trust the infrastructure that's running there. So a lot of important uh, glue there that has to happen. That's exactly what Lightwave is looking at. 
The other part about LightWave, though, is that support, broad support, for all these different protocols and standards. Again, you know, these new cloud native apps, they're not going to live in some little island of the data center by themselves. They're absolutely going to plug in to all the existing data center services you already have. So that means they need to integrate with those services as well. And so that's exactly why we're, we're built, we built all that stuff out. Finally, it's got to be scalable and multi-tenant, right? We're talking about very, very high scale, many different users potentially sitting on top of this. So you need to be able to handle all that. And again, LightWave is open source. The idea is to collaborate with many of our partners, as you'll hear from in a little while, as well as many others in the ecosystem about how to push security for cloud native applications forward. And in fact, here are some of the partners we're partnering on um, <clears throat> today. Uh, we'll hear from Pivotal and Mesosphere in just a few minutes. Intel, of course, everyone knows we've been working closely with them for 15, 16 years and really driving innovation at the virtualization level. And now we're excited to continue that collaboration at the security space. And then there's JFrog. JFrog produces a product called Artifactory that uh, we actually include as part of CodeStream, which I mentioned earlier. And so again, another area that we need to secure and lock down is where that code comes from and really tying that to the orchestrator, tying that to the hosts. So a lot of great innovation opportunity there. So a lot of exciting things happening with LightWave. Now, as I said, identity and access management is part of it, but there's also an issue with the network, right? How do you actually create a dynamic network that can change with the application to policy, uh, topology to provide security? And so we have something there called Open Virtual Network that we're working uh, with the community on. We're actually building an open standard for virtual networking, just like we did for virtual switches a few years ago with the Open Virtual Switch or OVS project. So we have this. We've been collaborating with the community. We've got a proposal built out, and the teams are busily working on coding it. And I believe we'll have a first demo for it in the next month or so. So again, LightWave and OVN. The idea there is open ecosystem. These things will run anywhere, right? Any cloud, whatever our customers want to use and integrate with many of our ecosystem partners. But as of course, as we talk to customers, and as Pat mentioned, they're running vSphere or the vCloud suite, and they want to leverage these technologies on top of there. And they really want to make that experience seamless. They really want to have it built in. So when we look at a vSphere architecture here, for the network segment, instead of OVN, we of course have NSX, our network virtualization product. And then there's a question of Linux. As I said, Linux is becoming a standard building block in these next generation applications. And if it's becoming a standard, it really makes sense to try to simplify our customers' lives by baking Linux into the hypervisor, right? kind of melding them together to have one unit for compute for these next generation applications. What this means is that simpler management, because you're managing just one thing, and <clears throat> the other piece is that it's better security since we can really drive deeper integration in there. So that's exactly why we're excited to announce Project Photon, a lightweight, container-optimized Linux distro really focused on VMware vSphere and VMware hypervisor environments generally. So let's talk about Photon. So as I said, Photon is a container-optimized Linux OS. That means it's very lightweight, very minimal footprint, under 300 megabytes, very quick to install and to boot. And out of the box, it comes with support for all the different container formats and flavors uh, customers like and users like, Docker, Rocket from CoreOS, Garden from Pivotal. It's all there and built in. And as I said, you know, part of this concept is actually building it into vSphere, so really making it a core part of vSphere so that when you get vSphere, when you install it, Photon is just there. And we're going to work uh, internally as well as with the community to really see how we can optimize, para-virtualize Photon to get the top performance within a hypervisor. As I said, as part of vSphere, you get support, you get updates. It all kind of just works out of the box. Now, I want to make sure, a very important point here, we, you know, we're absolutely committed to supporting all types of operating systems on top of vSphere. As a matter of fact, um, you heard an announcement from us a month or two ago about how we added CoreOS support for both vSphere and vCloud Air. That commitment does not change. What we're trying to do here is just offer an out-of-the-box, really simple solution for our customers to consume. And as I said, it's open source. So the idea is that we can collaborate with our partners and with the community on evolving this notion of container-optimized, hypervisor-optimized Linux distro. So it's available now. You can see the URL there. Uh, we're working with some partners here. Uh, most of them I, I've talked to already. HashiCorp is one that I haven't. Of course, you know, a good partner of ours, working very closely with them to really simplify the consumption of Photon for developers, whether it's you know, using it on Vagrant or uh, available on Atlas as well. So some really cool stuff for both of those pieces. So again, the high-level notion here was that we want to make developers first-class users of the data center. As I said, there's a long road to go here, and these are the initial announcements, but we think very powerful and very interesting. 
Again, Photon uh, for the Linux distro and Lightwave, identity and access management for cloud native applications. We're open sourcing them so we can engage the community in really driving these standards forward and helping to think openly and you know, differently about how security should work in these next gen application spaces. But as I said, we can't do this alone, right? It's all about partners and working together with partners. The amount of work here is just too big for any one company or person to do. And so it's incumbent upon us to work closer with all of our partners and the community to drive this forward. So the first partner I'd like to invite up on stage to talk about what they're doing is CoreOS. So you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with CoreOS. They really kicked off this uh, minimal Linux distribution concept a couple of years ago and been driving a tremendous amount of innovation in that space. And so from CoreOS, we have Alex Polvey, who is the CEO and founder. Alex. Thank you, Kit. All right, how how's you? it going? <laughs> good, how are you? I'm good, I'm good. So thank you so much for joining. Um, so, you know, for those, again, most people probably know you guys, but for those that don't, maybe tell you a little bit about uh, your philosophy, your direction at CoreOS. You know, I know when we first talked, um, the, your passion for security was obvious and just, mm -hmm. you know, very front and center. And that's driven a lot of your design decisions. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that and kind of what you've been doing in that space. Sure. So when we started CoreOS, very focused on security, our team was looking at what could we do to fundamentally improve the security of the Internet. And our key observation is around updates, that updates are really the key to good security. Mm -hmm. And um, so CoreOS Linux, our lightweight Linux OS for running containers, <laughs> uh, has some novel features about how um, updating and security systems and everything um, that's built in there. We have a set of components, such as things like etcd and Rocket, which you mentioned, which are these open source tools that are freely reused that, that are enabling this next generation of, of running um, infrastructure in this way. Cloud native is you know, right. what we're calling it. Yep. <laughs> Seems to be the term. So, right. So, as you mentioned, you guys have a lightweight Linux distro. We're doing this with Photon. Um, but you know, at the same time, I want to. So, I want to call out that we're absolutely fully supportive. We have a lot of folks, customers who are very interested in running CoreOS, and happy to have you as a partner. But really, you know, our collaboration is really around security, right? And you guys have been doing a lot of security uh, focus around the container engine with something called the App Container Spec and Rocket. Right. So, you can talk a little bit about what the, the genesis of those and what the idea is there. Sure. So I think if we're talking about Photon versus CoreOS, you know, this is where we're supposed to start the arm wrestling. Yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> yeah. But no, the reason we're up here today is because while we might have differences of opinion of, of how you know, the, the internal details of a Linux operating system should be built, that's fine. At least for our users, what we do share is we want choice and we want open standards. Absolutely. And so as part of the announcement today that you know, why we're here with you is because we, we both agree that there needs to be more standards and interoperability between different containers based environments. So a few months ago we proposed something called the app container specification, which is a standard similar to OBF in the, mm -hmm. in the right. VMware, you know, hypervisor world yep. um, for what a container image is, a container runtime is, and, and so on. Rocket is an implementation of app container. App container is a specification, and you know, today we're excited to, to partner yeah. up around app container with VMware. Right, and we're happy to drive that standard forward to, to engage with you guys and think about how we can really drive security as a primitive into some of these container formats. Mm -hmm. Cool. So, um, okay. So, as I said, you know, partners very critical for VMware. Maybe you guys can talk a bit about how you guys see partners and their importance for how you drive uh, the, the technology forward and make it better for customers. Sure. So. We're building a set of open source components. Chorus Linux is one. Again, Rocket, which is part of Photon, is another. Etcd is a, a yep. distributed data store that you know, is used by a variety of systems out there. So our model is to build these open source components that are, are reusable uh, to move infrastructure forward to this next phase. We think that there's just plenty of white space that needs right. to be filled in and built. And we want to build these tools in such a way that you know, ecosystem partners and we can all share the tools and not have to rebuild a bunch of different pieces. We, exactly. we can share the components that are best tools for the job. Yep. Okay. Then our model is we build products, you know, using those tools okay. that also cater to this this emerging wave infrastructure. But you know, we, we've gotten here today because of you know ecosystem partners and, and really collaborating around open source. Uh, we're excited to check out you know both Photon and Lightwave and and pull in the the best components of that into our systems that that make sense. And you know we hope VMware continues to use the pieces that make sense to them as well. You know, App Container, Rocket, Etcd, and so All on. Right. Yeah, cool. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming up and sharing your thoughts and uh, looking forward to innovating with you. Uh, all right. Thanks, <laughs> thanks man. All right. All right. So really cool stuff going on with CoreOS, you know, that security focus they've had from the beginning. Really great stuff. So a lot of exciting things there.
So the next partner is another one you probably heard of, Mesosphere. Uh, so Mesosphere uh, kind of is driving the evolution of the Apache Mesos open source project. And Mesos is used at Twitter, Airbnb, a lot of the web giants, and you know, really figure out how to run these things at scale. So from Mesosphere, I have Ben Heinemann, who is the chief architect and co-founder. Ben. How you doing? Hey, good, kid. OK, so uh, thanks so much uh, for joining me and for us. <laughs> and um, just like you know, with Alex and CoreOS, can you give us just a little bit of background about what you've been doing with Mesosphere? I hear you have this DCOS project. Tell us a little bit about that and kind of what your next steps sure, are. Sure, yeah. So at Mesosphere, what we're building is the, the data center operating system, which is a DCOS for short. And basically, it's a, it's, it's a layer of software that lets us combine all the machines you have in your data center, whether they're virtual machines or physical machines, and pull them all together, as you mentioned earlier, like one big computer. So it's easier to run your applications and easier to manage your applications and really actually treat the developer as a first class entity in the data center. So it's easier for them to build cloud native applications on, on top as well. Right. So the idea here is that you can layer the DCOS on top of whatever existing infrastructure you have. So if you built out a vCloud cluster or excuse me, vSphere cluster or vCloud suite, you can just put uh, the DCOS right on top of there and get running with it. That's exactly right. Yep. OK, cool. Well, let's, you, know, you brought a demo. Let's, let's check out this demo to see what this looks like. Cool. Start the demo. Awesome. Cool. So, so, so what we have here is this is actually the visualizer to one component of the data center operating system, the, the, the GUI component. And what you see here is a bunch of these donut graphs, which are really representing all those machines, like virtual machines you've gotten from, from, from a v VMware cluster. So each of these is a virtual machine running somewhere in the fabric of infrastructure. And you, we have kind of a single pane of glass view on what's going on. There. That's exactly right. So in this case, they're all zero because we're not currently running any workloads. OK. So we're going to just freshly start it off. And it uh, looks like there's a command line here in addition to yep, the GUI. So in addition to the GUI, we've got, a, we've got a command line interface. You need multiple interfaces for your data center. So that's the okay. command line. And typed it out to DCOS. And it just showed a bunch of the, the commands that you can run right now. Um, one of the first ones we're going to run is uh, uh, using Marathon. Marathon is one of these cloud native applications that has been built directly on top of, of uh, the Mesosphere data center operating system. You can see it's pre-installed on the side. It's kind of like our init D for the data center. It, it manages a whole bunch of these basic apps like, like, like Rails. So this is what we're actually doing right now is we're launching a pretty simple Rails app. We do that with DCOS Marathon Start, and the Rails app gets started. And you'll see pretty quickly that um, it gets scheduled somewhere in the data center. So that's great. So it's very easy, you know, one, one command line to get a way to do this. But let's talk a bit about security. Yeah. Right? Where does the security come in here? You know, who is this user? Do they have permission to start this? Where is the app coming from? And you know, so let's, talk, let's talk through that. That's exactly <laughs> right. So that, that's one of the critical components here is, is we're, since we're making it as easy as just using an API, as, as uh, 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 we were talking about earlier, we want to be able to make sure that we can have the identity and access management integrated in as tightly as possible so that we know who's authenticated to run what applications and who's authorized to run what applications. Right. OK, so, um, so we're doing that. Now it looks like we're scaling something up That's here. right, right. So again, it, making APIs be what, what developers use instead of anything else. It's as easy as just running a command. Quickly, I've scaled my application from one, one instance to 15 instances somewhere right. across we the We can very visually see it here. So now that we have 15 instances running, talk a bit about the implications for the network there, right? Because yeah. you clearly need to connect all these guys so they can talk to each other. Presumably. That's exactly right, yeah. So, so uh, uh, we're working closely to, to integrate with things like the open v switch and, and other products that, yeah. that, that you guys Open are working on. Oh, yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. So that when, when, you, when, when you launch these applications, you can make sure that you have your own isolated network so that, that, that the right. security concerns that you're dealing with are. are really are, orchestrate the whole process. That's exactly network, right. Network everything. So what, what, what we've popped up here is a whole bunch of other these cloud native applications that we've built to run on the data center operating system. And one that we just kind of dragged and dropped down was HTFS. This is a really interesting one because a lot of the things that people are running in their data centers are not just stateless services, but also stateful services. And we want ways to be able to run those as easily as the stateless services as well. So basically, there's kind of like a, a, an app store, if you will, there you, you could just choose from and you drag and drop. That's right. Yep. So I thought you know, it was complicated to set up HDFS. For it me. was. You know, it, it takes a lot of people a long time to, to, to actually set up HDFS, many, many man hours. And we're s solving that problem with software right. instead. Really automating it. OK, so we're installing HDFS. It's like we're installing something else here as well. That's right. So, so along with HDFS, we're installing Spark. This is kind of this nice marriage of running stateless services and big data analytics. So in this case, we're going ahead and we're installing Spark. And you'll see Spark showed up on the side with the installed services. Um, and now we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch a Spark job, um, um, which is going to be able to run in the cracks of all the resources that are available across the data center. So we just were installing it, and now we're running it. So presumably, there's also security concerns around installing it, Precisely and where right. it comes from. Who, who, who's allowed to run what applications? Right. How many resources are they able to use? Right. Yep, exactly. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to launch this, this Spark application. And you're going to see it's going to start to scale out. It'll be in blue. 
And again, any of the available resources that are, that are, that are idle at the time of the data center can immediately be used by Spark, um, which in some circumstances means that we can drive utilization of these machines as high as you know, 96%, as you can actually see on the slide. So yeah, so it's very clear visually kind of what's the marathon, what's the Spark. And uh, yeah, it looks you. I mean, do you guys have any sort of chargeback capability here? Because these <laughs> that's, smart guys. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this last little thing that you saw was a bunch of machines actually go away, and that's kind of our chaos monkey feature, um, uh, inspired by Netflix, and it, it, it just lets us actually induce failures in the system so we can see that everything gets scheduled appropriately across the data center. It's a great testing capability, right? Because if you're building on an app, you want to make sure that it works even if the physical machines go down. That's exactly so this right. is like what the chaos monkey does. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, very cool. So, okay, so that's great. And we talked a lot about how you know, great technology with the DCOS and a lot of opportunity to really make it fundamentally more secure by integrating with things like Lightwave, OVN, and more. Uh, so, any final thoughts on what you guys are doing, next steps in this space? No, I mean, I, I think it's a really critical c c component. Everyone's building these new cloud native applications. You want to be able to take one cloud native application from organization A and run it in organization B. And we really need something like open source technologies like Lightwave that can tie all these things together so it's easy to actually transition these applications between organizations. So, we're, we're excited to be here partnering with, with, with you guys on this awesome. open source tech. Thank you so much, Ben. Yeah. Thanks Thank for you. coming. Okay. Very cool. All right, so a lot of great stuff, innovation being driven out of Mesosphere, and a lot of great opportunities to really make sure that we can harden and secure those environments. OK, so the next partner is uh, kind of a special one for VMware, because a lot of their folks, a lot, even some of their technologies, came out of VMware uh, a couple of years ago. And so one specific one was Cloud Foundry that we started here at VMware in about 2010, and Pivotal has been driving it for the last couple of years. So I'd like to bring up on stage James Waters, our GM of Cloud Foundry, uh, who will really talk about what they're doing in that space and the exciting new, new announcements. Hey, James. Hey. Good to see you, Kit. How's it going? Awesome. So uh, as I said, you, know, you guys have been taking Cloud Foundry, working on it for the past couple of years. Yeah. You have some customers now. Maybe you can just give us a bit of an update on what it is and where it's going. Yeah, so Cloud Foundry was an early entrant into the cloud native uh, application space. Uh, started at, as an open source project in VMware in 2011. And we've actually been working on things like cloud native apps, container technology, uh, cloud uh, based installation uh, since then, mm -hmm. and doing things like embedding lightweight OSs. So it's pretty awesome to be here today and see all of that culminating. There's a lot of people using container technologies, lightweight embedded OS, enterprises using cloud native apps. Right. Okay, so that's great. And you're getting some success, customer traction. You got customers using this. Um, what's the next step? Yeah, so last year was really outstanding for us. You know, after a couple years of R&D, uh, we launched Pivotal Cloud Foundry as a product and set a record for uh, the fastest growing revenue for an open source product ever in its first year. So that was really driven by enterprises having to build cloud native scale out applications for the first time. Uh, things like IoT are huge drivers. Imagine a manufacturing company like GE suddenly having to connect all of those devices with uh, digital information and experiences. So they're really looking for a platform to get started on mm -hmm. versus some of the big web companies like Netflix that could build their own. Right. Uh, so they're turning to Cloud Foundry. Yep. All right, so you have an announcement today. Yeah, so Let's talk about that. The, the limitation of Cloud Foundry before was sort of all or nothing. Okay. Like you wanted uh, our embedded OS, our data schedulers, everything all in it. Mm -hmm. And it was a little harder for small teams. So we're uh, breaking out part of Cloud Foundry today called Lattice, which is optimized at a very lightweight package for uh, small teams and developers. So I okay. wanted to give a quick demo of that on Photon today. Okay, so basically what you're doing is taking the power of Cloud Foundry and really simplifying it for easy consumption by developers or small ops teams or thereof, right? Yeah, we're taking that same um, battle tested at tens of thousands of application container technology and bringing it down into a developer desktop or a small work group. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's check out that demo. Yeah. So what do you have for us today? <laughs> Well, you know, we actually wanted to show off installing it on Photon. So uh, Ryan Morgan, who's a great engineering leader for our team, helped me make this video. And we went through, and this is running on Photon Live. Okay. And it only takes about uh, 40 seconds to uh, get everything going for a lattice cluster on Photon. So, so cool. So we got this is a Photon VM. You're doing uh, one curl command here to bring this thing down. Yep. And now it's installing, basically. Yeah, we've noticed using developing in Go, it's incredibly fast, starts up, okay. very easy to download and uh, to consume. So while this thing installs, maybe talk a little bit about um, you know, what you're seeing at customer sites. Are customers really embracing this cloud native application architecture? Is yeah. something that they're you know, interested in? Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, the word monolith has almost become pejorative. Mm -hmm. And that's when you know that an era has turned and there's a new page in history, is when the opposite of it becomes kind of something you don't want to be. And so I meet a lot of customers that go, you know, we have monolithic applications. And they're saying that in a way of like, come help me. And this is across the Fortune 500, everyone's recognized that they need to empower developers with microservices. 
both to scale out and to rapidly deliver and get resiliency. And that's what's in this demo today. Mm -hmm. So this is a Spring Boot application. Uh, Netflix, Adrian Cocroft, they use Spring Boot, Spring Framework uh, for a lot of what they do. Okay. And you're going to see a Spring Boot application started as a Docker image um, on okay, Lattice. So you support Docker here as well. Absolutely. I mean, Docker is the artifact currency of the container age. So it's really important that container platforms support Docker as an artifact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. OK, so and what's this thing on the left here? Um, the, 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 the web, what, what's the web page there showing yeah. us? Yeah, so this is a tool we call X-Ray, okay. which helps developers visualize where each um, application process has been started. One of the unique things about Lattice, though, is it comes with a built-in load balancer. So as that Docker image application, Spring Boot application starts up, it's automatically going to join a load balancer. So what you'll see here is we'll scale up that application. And without any other configuration, Lattice will automatically load balance between all of the nodes. OK, cool. <coughs> and um, so that's great. So I have another question on Photon. So you're running yeah, on top of Photon that's here. Right. You've built Lattice into that. Yeah. Presumably Cloud Foundry will integrate with that as well. Yeah, I think one of the things that people are looking for in Cloud Foundry is it comes with its own OS. And one of the questions I like to ask CIOs is why are you still managing operating systems? And if you're just really about delivering cloud native applications that scale out with the homogenous OS, why would you tolerate any variance? So I'm really excited about embedding um, Photon into all of the Cloud Foundry, including the Lattice use case. Cool. OK, so let's get back to the demo here. So yeah. we see uh, we provisioned one instance, it looks like, and now it looks like we're going to scale uh, to additional instances. Yeah, and so you'll see the X-ray uh, visualization tool here is going to show uh, that you've now scheduled it across three nodes. And it's blinking in a lighter way because the JVM of the app hasn't started up yet, but it's been scheduled and it's ready to go. OK. And then there's a load balancer that actually sits on front of there so that you can you know, talk to a single endpoint and it'll load balance automatically between those instances. That's the key about Cloud Foundry is our application centricity. So we really reduce the networking surface area of all of our container management technology to be developer friendly. A lot of other container management technologies come from a sysadmin up perspective. We really think about this as developer down and that's what's so different about Lattice. All right, awesome. So it looks like we can, we just flew by there, but you can see both visually what's happening as well as on, even on the command line. Yeah, that's right. There's a, uh, a command line tool called Veritas that helps you visualize the containers as well. Okay. And we're going to flip it over here to uh, um, a slightly larger demo of a scale out of this application. All this app is doing is reading back uh, the values of um, the uh, load balancing. Yeah, the, the network configuration. That's right. So I think we saw that a bit earlier. So OK, so now we have it. Excuse me, it's running three instances, That's ready right. to go. So now we're actually going to test that out and see what that looks like. So again, here we're running on a certain port, and the port's going to change as we talk to the different instances, presumably. And that's key. If you get back to the fundamentals of what you mentioned about cloud-native applications, they need built-in resiliency. Mm -hmm. So if you start developing an application on Lattice spread across three nodes, you know from the beginning it's going to behave appropriately in a distributed fashion. Right. And that's because a lot of the hard work is taken care of by the Lattice framework. That's right. OK, cool. So look at this. What is this here? This is more interesting. So this is more of a work group size setting. And remember, the core technology in Lattice can scale to tens of thousands of applications, just like Cloud Foundry. So we've set it up on six virtual machines here. And we're just going to do a quick Chaos Monkey style resiliency test, remove two of the virtual machines. You'll see in about two seconds, Lattice will reschedule uh, those container applications to run and also rejoin them to the load balancer. So all of the configuration of failover is completely taken care of. One two, and it should be back up. There All it is. Right. There it is. That's quick. So basically, you know, Lattice is taking a lot of that, that work out of the developers uh, uh, focus by just doing it for them. That's right. And that's what gets people so excited in the enterprise about cloud native applications. It allows them to scale out faster, deliver business value at a higher, higher rate of iteration, and fundamentally lower their operating costs. When people right. see that they don't have to have trouble tickets to respond to things that go down, it's just automatically rescheduled, they get really excited. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming up, James. Really appreciate it. Great to be here. All right. Thanks. Awesome. So again, lots of innovation across all the different partners that we have. And anyway, we had a few up on stage. We have some more listed here. Again, a lot of exciting things we're doing across the board. So kind of in summary, you know, again, the day started with us outlining our vision for this cloud native application space. Why is it that we created a team to do this? Why is it that we're focusing on this area? You know, as James was mentioning, I think James summed it up pretty well. Is there's a huge opportunity here for businesses to really drive innovation and greater customer engagement via software technologies. And we want to make sure we can help our customers realize that possibility. 
So then, you know, specifically for today, we announced two different open source projects, LightWave and Photon. Photon, of course, being a lightweight container optimized Linux distribution, really focused on vSphere and VMware environments. And then LightWave, identity and access management for the cloud native world, really focused on those applications and infrastructure components. And then James just joined me here to announce what they're doing at, at Pivotal with Lattice. It's really a lightweight way to consume Cloud Foundry components. So again, a lot of exciting things going on. But you know, as I said a few times, this is just the be beginning, and it's a very long journey. The reality is that there's a lot of stuff to, to solve here, a lot of really hard problems. We're not gonna be doing this alone, we're absolutely gonna be engaging with our ecosystem partners. So look for us to, just like we want our customers do, be releasing early and often. Look for more announcements from us throughout the rest of the year and beyond. But for the time being, you know, shout out, give, give us a shout out on Twitter and check out our GitHub. Thank you guys so much, have a good day.